So in this video, we're going to talk about the high-frequency cross-coupled pair, or XCP, as it's often called. I, I really think that's a cool acronym, so I'm just going to use it. Uh, well, we analyzed the cross-coupled pair in the last video, and just at DC frequencies, and we said that the input admittance, or the input impedance, whichever one you'd like to refer to, um, in this video, it would be more con convenient to talk about the admittance. But we said that the input admittance was equal to minus GM over 2 times 1 minus 1 over GM RO. And that was just our result. So this allowed us to generate a negative resistance uh, so long as GM RO is greater than 1. And we can tune that resistance whatever to however we want by just changing GM. So all we need to do is change our bias conditions. But uh, we neglected, we included RO, but we neglected all the capacitors, which we know are going to be important at high frequencies. So we're going to add those back in uh, in this video. And I'm going to show you uh, how to analyze this circuit, hopefully from the easiest way possible. So we've got our transistors M1, M2. So if we just draw out all the capacitances without thinking, uh, this is just CGS1. This is CGS2. Uh, we've got CDB1, and so we, we assume that our body is grounded, uh, and CDB2, and then we've got CGD, so this is CGD2 and CGD1. And I've excluded CSB because CSB is just shorted to itself. Well, okay, uh, this is a little ugly, so let's let's make it prettier. Um, which capacitances are can we combine together? So we know that the gates are cross-coupled to each other, or cross-coupled to each other's drains. So this you can think of sliding uh, one and one end of the capacitors uh, along these nodes that we've drawn. So for CGS, uh, so let's say CGS two. Um, see this node, uh, we're going to drag it. Uh, we're going to drag this wire up here, and we recognize that CGS two is just in parallel with CDB one because they're both connected to this node up here, and they're both connected to ground here. So this has a capacitor going out like this, which we're going to call uh, CDB1 plus CGS2. And over on the other side, um, it's the same exact thing, except this is CDB2 plus CGS1. And then the only ones we have left to worry about are CGD. And again, we're going to do a little dragging trick. So if we drag uh, this node and we say, oh, let's tug it over here, we see that it connects M1's gate to M2's gate. And similarly, if we drag this capacitor's node here, we see that it also connects M1's gate to M2's gate. So this just results in a capacitance between the two gates. Uh, that's CGD1 plus CGD2. And if you don't like my uh, my dragging uh, technique, try to imagine it in your head. Uh, you can just figure out which nodes are connected where uh, by writing out what the what the nodes are. Okay, that's our uh, that's our simplified uh, circuit. Now let's draw out the small signal model for it in its completeness. So there will be no omissions here, except that the circuit is linear when in fact it's not. Um, I'm going to call this. Capacitance, actually, let me draw RO first. I'm going to call this capacitance CDB1 plus CGS2 uh, CO, um, just for convenience, because you know it's in parallel with RO, and that sounds nice. Um, so we've got this circuit over here, then we've got our two gates connected, and uh, the gates being connected is the same as the two drains being connected because they're cross-coupled to each other. So 
you can say either the two drains are connected or the two gates are connected. That means the same exact thing. And now we're going to assume that the transistors are matched. So we didn't do that for the capacitance adding, uh, but we're going to say that they're matched here. So this is two CGD, just CGD period. ROs are the same, GMs are the same, and everything is the same. Excellent. So this is our circuit. And remember that last time we analyzed this circuit by using its anti-symmetry. So uh, let me just erase this one uh, above real quick. So we said that if we apply a voltage source, Vx, and there's a current coming out of it, Ix, we said that, well, because of the because the circuit is purely anti-symmetric, this node V1 must be the minus of this node minus V1. But we've got this annoying capacitance here, 2 CGD, and that uh, that kind of that kind of makes it more difficult to analyze because the circuit's still anti-symmetric, but we've got to worry about current flowing through here and everything. So it would be nice if we could just uh, get rid of that. Well. If we could, uh, how would we do it? Well, we know that the voltage across here uh, is 2V1. The voltage across this capacitor is 2V1. And so it's got a certain current flowing into it, I. Well, if we don't want to perturb anything about the circuit, and we still want the same current flowing through uh, a capacitor, maybe not it's in this loop, maybe not, maybe it's not in this location, uh, but we don't want to change any of the voltages and we don't want to change any of the currents, then we can add a capacitance over here with value for CGD, um, because this is still going to have a so instead of having a voltage two V1 across it, this is going to have a voltage V1 across it. But in order to keep the same current flowing through it, we need to double the capacitance. So this is kind of a trick. It comes from uh, Miller's theorem, which is a a theorem, not an approximation, as many people would like you to believe, um, although there is an approximation based on the theorem. So if we add two sets of four CGD to either side, then we basically can get rid of this internal CGD. And the reason we can do that is because we're not perturbing any of the currents flowing out of this node. We're not changing any of the voltages, and we're not changing any of the currents. The only thing we're doing is moving around elements, and we're totally allowed to do that. Um, it's an equivalent circuit, so long as we don't change any of the voltages or the currents. Well, OK. Um, now this circuit is much simpler to analyze, because we can do it in exactly the same way as we did the last time. Uh, but you see, we, we get this pesky RO and a capacitance here, and I just want that to be one element, just because it makes our lives way easier. So we're going to call that whole thing ZO. Uh, and ZO is just going to be uh, RO in parallel with uh, CO plus 4CGD. And yeah, I've, I'm, a, I'm being kind of loose with my notation. Um, let, me, let me clean that up for those of you that uh, that are bothered by it, RO in parallel with G omega, uh, C0 plus 4 G omega, or sorry, G omega, C0 plus 4 G omega, uh, CGD. So that gives us a much simplified circuit, which we can analyze in the same exact way as we did in the last video. So now we've got uh, our same perfectly anti-symmetric circuit. These are grounded. These are grounded. This is node V1. This is minus V1. So this is GM or minus GM V1. This is GM V1. And we can write out the equations for it, or we can just use the results from last time, uh, which is that Ix over Vx is equal to minus gm over 2 plus 1 over 2. But now instead of R0, we have Z0, uh, because we're just, we're just replacing R0 with Z0. And we can write this 
this is why I was using uh, admittance from the beginning instead of impedance, because it makes it easier to expand. If we say that instead this is minus gm over 2 plus 1 half, why not? Because why not is literally just 1 over z naught. Uh, then why not is much much easier to express in terms of just all the values that were given. So minus gm over 2 plus 1 half. Uh, well, the first part of why not is 1 over ro. Uh, the second part of why not, so it's in parallel with a capacitance, um, so j omega co. And that capacitance is co plus 4 cgd. And if you have trouble following along with the math, just remember z naught. Uh, we got it from uh, we got it from this parallel combination of four CGD, CO, and R naught. And now I'm just expanding it. So I'm uh, I'm undoing the cheating that I did to make the circuit much easier to analyze. Uh, and now if we separate this in terms of its real and imaginary parts, we get minus GM over two times 1 minus 1 over GMRO. So this is a purely real purely real term, and it's dependent on GM and RO, or GM and GMRO, the transistor gain, uh, plus J omega times 1 half. Uh, and then recall CO was just CGS plus CDB. And then add for CGD. And remember the one half is coming from our uh, our analysis the, that um, the impedance is equal to 2 times V1, or sorry, 2 times V1 over the V1 Ix as a function of V1. And so that, that's where the one half comes from in each of the terms. So this is interesting because it's the same exact result that we had before in terms of the real part. So the real part is unchanged. And if we're trying to design a model of what this thing looks like, it's got a negative real resistance in parallel with a, a regular old capacitor. And the resistance value is GM over 2 times 1 minus 1 over GMRO. And we do have to be careful that GMRO is greater than 1 so that the input admittance is actually negative. And the capacitance is just 1 half uh, CGS plus CDB plus 4 CGD. So we get a negative resistance, but it does come at the cost of a capacitance that we add in parallel with it. So we just can't avoid that. Um, no matter what happens, we end up needing um, needing to use a capacitance. That's that's okay. Um, but this is this completes the anal the high frequency analysis of our cross coupled pair. In the next video, we'll show how to use it in an oscillator. So we know we can create a negative resistance, but how do we actually use that to make an oscillator that oscillates with a certain amplitude? And that's what we'll talk about in the next video.